يذكر يا إنسان لو أطلقته متأملا في قدرة الرحمن لخضعت إجلالا وتسبيحا له سبحانه رب عظيم الشان Once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Maybe we'll try that one again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ah, there we go. See my students, they know what to do, mashallah. Allahumma barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'ad. Always we begin with the praise of Allah. We send our prayers of peace upon our Nabi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We testify with firmness and conviction that none is worthy of worship but Allah, that our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshiping slave and final messenger. I always remind myself and you, of your children, of taqwallah azza wa jal. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inherits in myself and you in our private life, more so than what we seek to show each other publicly, that we have a greater love for Allah and a greater fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a greater hope in His mercy. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you and I from those who are fortunate to receive the shafa'ah and the intercession of our Rabbi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a pleasure, alhamdulillah, to have all of you who are joined us here today. I know it's 7 o'clock on a Friday. It's a little bit cold, uh, but it's a beautiful occasion whenever we gather together to think about the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu his way of life. And I don't want you to think of this word sunnah as uh, you know something technical or uh, you know religious law alone. I want you to think of it as a habit. What the Prophet did, said, acted, agreed, allowed, permitted, what he allowed to be done in front of him and didn't object to, all of these are things that we consider sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa And to cut to the issue of tonight in Shabbat, uh, last time we met, uh, my discussion was about dynamics of family leadership and how to believe that we are leaders and custodians within our home. Khutbah al Jum'ah today, I spoke to our kids about the hadith of the Prophet Kullukum ra'in. All of you are responsible for something. And all of you have been given that responsibility by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will question us about it. Today is a second part to it. And just if you follow me on the screen behind me, I want you to know that this is part of a, a, a series that I do. And the series is um, related to the series is related to Islamic intimacy, and it's an Islamic intimacy course. Uh, that's really the, the premise behind it. And when I talk about intimacy, I don't want you to confuse it as being something that's uh, sexualized. Intimacy is that between you and another person, there is something that other people don't have. Between my wife and I, there's something nobody else has. Between my daughter and I, there's something nobody else has. It's a relationship that I have built with her, with my family, that nobody else is privy to, nobody else can share it. And this is a really important concept for us as Muslims to understand that our basis of relationships and how we presume to love and to share with each other is not just left for us to decide. It was taught to us by our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah tells us that of the ultimate objectives for you and I to come together to bring a new family into the world, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا that we find sukoon with one another. We find tranquility. So when you ask me in Arabi, Aina Tasqun, where it's not where do you live, it's where do you find comfort? Where do you find rest, repose, tranquility, rahmah, sakina? Where is your sakina? So I say askunu, if you're hunting there. It seems strange. Is really hunting there the place of sukoon? I don't know. Right? May Allah give us jannati wa nahma, gardens of jannah, Allahumma amin. Mithaskunu ilayha is the basis of what you and I see 
for our families, for our children. You want our children, I want my children to grow up in a home where there is greater love that they experience than anything else. So I begin by asking you, and I want you to look up at the screen, my family. I want you to think of your family. All of us, we have different families. The Qur'an is full of different families. The Qur'an is full of families that are broken families by today's standards. Ibrahim alayhi salam, you might consider him, as they say, wrong, wrongly, an absent father. He wasn't there to raise Ismail. You have people today who will look at the Qur'anic narrative, not understanding the Qur'an. They will say, what kind of man leaves his family in the desert? Musa alayhi salam, he climbs up a mountain and says to his wife, Um Kuthu, wait here. In the Anas I'm going to go up and see that fire. If you're lost in the desert, you wait here behind. Nuh alayhi salam, Allah says, gives us the example of Prophet Nuh of a man who lived with a wretched woman, who disobeyed Allah, condemned to a life of, of eternal damnation. They were treacherous. Allah gives you an example of Fir'aun, the most despicable of human beings. The wife of Pharaoh, subhanAllah. Look at the juxtaposed position that Allah gives you. The worst of men with the best of women. A woman that would be so pure that in Jannah, we are told by the Nabi Sallallahu that she will be the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see the example of a single mother in the mother of Isa Alayhi Salaam, fearful, entering into a city where people are going to accuse her of sin. You see the example of brothers, children of prophets, grandchildren of a prophet, grandchildren of Ibrahim. Imagine, like there's no uh, chain of narration. There is no greater family link than this. The children of Ya'qub, who is the son of Ishaq, son of Ibrahim What do they do? They hate their brother so much that they almost kill him. And it wasn't for just one of them who said, لا يوسف في Don't kill him, but get him out of our, get him out of our family. Throw him in a well. People from a camera will take him far away. All of those are families. And I want you to think of your family. Whatever your family is constructed as. And Allah gives you so many constructed families so that you and I have an example of every type of family that we could ever imagine. And I want you to think about those two things. What's great? And if you could make a list tonight, you go home, if you can make a list now, what, what's the best thing that your family has for it? And I can tell you, you're not going to begin by saying, we're rich. You're not. You're, we have a nice car. Our mortgage is almost paid. That's not the first thing that's going to come to mind. What's great about your family? What, what do you like? About your children, about your wife. About your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, your in-laws, your mother-in-law. The dragon. What do you... And at the same time, I want you to think, hold on, what needs improvement? What, what do we need to change? And I want you to keep those two thoughts. The best, and second to the best. And I hope that you're here for these particular reasons. These are some of the reasons that came to mind that I wanted to offer. I want you to ask yourself, why do you want to listen and hear discussions that relate to families? Why is it that most people will come and will say to me, Oh brother, yeah, it would be great if you could have a talk to my children. Brother, yeah, you know my son is getting to an age, have a talk with my son. Nobody ever comes and says, Brother Yaki, can I ever talk to me about my son? Never. I've never, until now, 18 years of teaching, had one parent come and say to me, Sheikh Yaki, my son is giving me a tough time. What's wrong with me? 
Can you help me? What am I doing wrong? It's one of the problems I have. I have sons, I have a daughter as well. These people I have to turn to and ask. What's our intention? What's your definition of successful? Is your family successful? Some of us, mashallah, when people see you from outside, they say, mashallah, this is a beautiful family. And then the door gets locked, and you're inside, and subhanallah. Successful family, successful home, successful car, successful privilege, successful profession, successful education, successful marks. But in other ways, unsuccessful. What is your goal? And what is my goal for the family? Are the goals, do they have to be the same? And can my goal be different to your goal? Can my wife's goal, who's a part of my family, be different for our family than what my goal is for my family? What are my rights? But more importantly, what am I obligated to provide? What is owed to me and what do I owe to others? So I wish inshallah today that when we begin, this is actually the first part of a four part series that I teach. Right? So I teach this program, it's four parts, and it's about getting into it, learning how to love our family, our children, our spouse, our grandchildren. Right? Why is it important? Well, it's a command from Allah. Because we today, Allah wants you to establish that in my life and your life to find a way to grow in that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to follow the sunnah of our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know one of the most beautiful hadith? A lady comes and says to Aisha radiallahu anha Allah. She says, now that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away, what do you miss the most about it? Yeah, what, what would your wife miss the most about you? That's what she's asking Aisha. So Aisha, she says, Whenever he entered the room, he would greet me with salam. He sat near me. Next to me. And he would put his fingers in my fingers. That's the thing I miss the most about, about the Nabi Muhammad. That when he would sit with me, he would sit next to me and he would hold my hand. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is it important? Well, it's an aman. It's a trust. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we misunderstand this word uh, khalifa. Inna ja'alnaakum, inni ja'aluha khalifa ta fil ard. Adam, I'm going to make you a khalifa on this earth. Meaning you're a steward of the earth. You're going to lead one generation to be respectful of the one that comes after it. That you're going to leave the world in a way that the next generation will prosper more than you prosper. And of course, when you do it wrong, that you see the fil'ad. That's not Don't ruin what I meant for you to maintain. Why did the Prophet ﷺ say it is half of the deen that when we build a family? How is it half of my deen that when I said qabilti, I accept my wife, I accept the responsibility of a family? How is it that only by uttering that word, taking someone in wedlock, that I can complete half of my iman? It is key to Jannah. And that's why you hear the words of the Prophet he would say to some of the young people, he would say, under your father, mother's foot, it's not all mothers. Some of the mothers, they get upset. It's a wrong hadith. Where you say, I didn't attack the Aqdam, and in Maha, all mothers. No. The Prophet pointed to certain mothers. Because there's some mothers, Jannah is not under her foot. Jahannam is under her foot. That's the reality. Other mothers, you find two Jannah. Jannah for you, Jannah for her. Right? This is what the ulama teaches. The key to paradise. The Prophet said, Awsa, Abwab al Jannah. The middle door of the door of Jannah is your father, your mother. The Prophet ﷺ says to a righteous woman, if she prays five times a day, if she completes her siyam when she's able, if she's devoted to her husband, and he said to her, enter Jannah from any door you want. 
It is the natural disposition Allah intended for you and I to have families and companionship. We never sent even a messenger except that they had wives and children. Isa alayhi salam, he when he returns, peace and blessings be upon him, he will marry from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will have for our our people. Also to provide comfort. Question of course is why do families suffer? There are sometimes personal issues. Somebody entered into a marriage and they have personal problems that came into it. Unfulfilled love stories, love strategies. MashaAllah. Oh, if once we get married, brother, Allah sometimes I have some of our former students, Allah is having a sister, a young she'll come to a chef, a family. I said, only him, not be him. She goes, Chef, you need to help me convince my father. I said, well, I don't do anything like that. You need to convince your father. How did you find, oh, you know, in her mind, Khalas. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, forget about them. You're going to write new books about us. That's what you hear sometimes. And it's unfulfilled. You had a dream, and Martin Luther King is out. He's not around. There's no fulfillment to that dream. There's also negative anger. The reason we're staying together is for the wrong reason. Sometimes people, they hold on to a failed relationship that they should have jumped out of the car a long time ago. It's a train wreck, and you need to jump, save your life. And that's why Allah allowed the talaq. At-talaq al-maratan. Fa-imsaq al-ma'ruf. Aw, tasri'um bi I know it's hard to hear that, but that's our theme. It's the worst of the halal, but it is halal, it's a necessity. In fact, halal at times becomes what? Compulsory for some. There's also emotional debts. Sometimes we feel hostage, or I've given so much I can't go back. Or I said to my family that he is the one, she is the one, and now if I come and say to them, help me, he wasn't, they're going to say, we told you. Why didn't you listen? So people stay in places that they shouldn't be. There is scorekeeping. You did this, so I can do that. You forgot this, so I can forget this. I made this mistake, but you did worse. Loss of trust. And it's very difficult. Trust takes time. It is lost instantly. Instantly. As a child, you can lose it. As a father, you can lose it. To your children, your children lose trust. Look at Musa alayhi salam. Look at how he speaks to his family. When he says to his wife and children, wait here, he says, Maybe if I go up the mountain, maybe I can bring back fire. He doesn't say, I will. Why? Because if you promise something, you're not sure you can deliver, you're going to weaken yourself the rest of your life. Oh, give me the money, we're going to invest it. Wallahi, we'll make money. Wallahi. If you, Allah told you, I had a yeah, I saw a dream. No. Don't promise what cannot be assured. Finally, meddling. People, mashallah. They have love for you so much that they want to destroy what you have that is good. Some people they give the nice word, the nice to help you ruin your own relationship. May Allah protect us all. Three critical mistakes. And I know it sounds we're beginning negative. And it's intentional. Because the Prophet I want you to understand that our sunnah is taught not just to do what's good, but also to know what is not good. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu Allah, he says, كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنَ الْخَيْرِ He would always come and ask the Prophet of good things. What should I do? وَأَنَا أَسْأَلُهُ عَنَ الشَّرْ But I only ask him about bad things. What's the worst thing, what's the worst case scenario Ya Rasulullah صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Three critical mistakes that social scientists Islamic scholars, psychologists, family workers, teachers will tell you bring ruin and disorder to what should be harmony, 
and sujood in a home. First, there's criticism. Look at what Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says to our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْلًا غَلِيبَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضْلُ الْحَوْمِ Ya Muhammad, if you were sharp tongues, yeah, if you were prone to just every time you see something, you give it, you give it to them. You let them know what they're doing wrong. غليظ القلب. And if your heart could not forgive others, لم فضل من حوله. Those Sahaba who are sitting with you now, they would have left you. You know Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه. Can you ever imagine Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Umar ibn Khattab, that these people would turn their back on Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم? You can't imagine it. But Allah said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, if your tongue was sharp, if you criticize day after day, and if you can't forgive the one who made a mistake, they would leave you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, blaming. And blaming anything that goes wrong in our relationships, in our children, in our households, in our families, is one of those things that erodes a person's sense of pride. Um, one of the programs that I do with your children, I'm just going to exit, is a program called Drug Proof. Now, Drug Proof is a program I do term three YouTube. And I actually sent a message out of it on Connected that if you have anything in high school you don't want me, I can exclude your children from it. This is what social scientists kind of tell you are the steps that lead to a person smoking weed, taking alcohol. And I want you to know that in this society, in Australia, the government doesn't really have a problem with people meditating themselves because it takes worries away. It's very profitable that you have one in every three car accidents is due to alcohol. It's very profitable. Uh, I'll show you those statistics. This is from the Department of Health. 30% of road accidents, alcohol. 44% of all fires, one out of every two fires, alcohol. 35% of people who fell down and needed help, alcohol. Legal. 60% of all crime that is reported, alcohol. 65% of all serious assaults, alcohol. 65% of minor assaults, alcohol. 340,000 people were hospitalized in 2016 for no other reason than alcohol. Meaning 1,000 people took up a bed in a hospital for no other reason than alcohol. But why? Why is weed being deregulated when we know that it is a cause, a leading cause of psychosis? People that smoke it, it leads them into psychosis. Why? Why are certain mechanisms in place? Because it suits different people in different times to have a medicated society. And you as a Muslim, one of the things your children will be assaulted with, I, my children will be assaulted with, is the proliferation of drugs. Alhamdulillah, I, you know, we, I work, our staff work incredibly hard to keep a drug-free school. Well, it is jihad. Wallahi, I consider it a jihad. To try to bring our children, because your son is going to go to work to Kmart, the person who stands next to them, in their break, smoked. The high school student smoked. In other places, it's, it's easier and cheaper to find weed than it is for a young person to get a cigarette. $30 a pack for cigarettes and you can get weed for a nickel bag, $5 little bags. It's, it's a major issue for those of you who have older children. It's not a joke. And I feel your pain and it's a pain that we all share. But what's the number one indicator? Family problems. That's a, the first step. So when your child feels disconnected, that they haven't bonded with you as a father, haven't bonded in particular a father, and haven't bonded with you as a mother, what your reaction is, is one of two things. You actually become too harsh, so you become like a helicopter. You stand over your son. 
And everything they do, you criticize and you blame. Your schoolwork, your friends, your salah, your hymn, your clothes, your music, your TV, your PlayStation, every single thing. So the only reaction that they can have is I'm good at nothing. So they lose self-esteem. And they grow up feeling I'm worthless. And the only way that my parents love me is I can perform what they want. So if I do something they want, my parents will love me. If I don't, and I can, I can't get a name like my sister can get it. I can't memorize Quran like my cousin does. I don't want to, you know, do the same things that other people do. I have a different kind of... So then I feel demoralized. And that love is based on performance. So the first person, the first person who shows me love and doesn't ask anything in return, it makes me think they love me more than my parents. That's why a lot of young girls do incredibly silly things with a, an older boy who shows them a little bit of attention. She feels that he loves me in a way other people, he understands me in a way other people don't understand me, he listens to me in a way other people don't listen. So I sit with your kids and I talk to them about this in Islamic studies class. I know you think they talk about Allah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But I'm waiting a battle on your behalf. It, it, it does come later, right? It does come. But what's the, the key? The turning point, not all children whose parents have, you know, difficulty with them and who lack of self-esteem become drug addicts. The turning point is the peer pressure. Why am I dressed like this today? MashaAllah, I look like a chef today. You guys normally see what I'm like, right? Pair of cargo pants. Because I want the kids to like me a little, right? All the young ones, they need to see I have better shoes than they do. Oh, yeah, where did you get your Nike? Shh, can't tell you. Special edition, right? It's on purpose. Why do I dress like this? Because sadly, some of us, we believe that the way you wear, how you dress is, the only way you're respected, it's peer pressure. You're my peers. I have to, I can't just come in a pair of jeans. You're like, oh yeah, what are you doing? Huh? All of us have peer pressure. You at work, you have peer pressure. I have peer pressure. Your children have peer pressure. Now the question is, who will their peers be? And that's one of the reasons you have them in my school. That's why, one of the reasons they're my children. Like I look at your children, like they're my children. Because my children are here. And if I have your children with my children, and your children are not good enough to be with my children, or if my children are not good enough to be with your children, then we all have a problem. Because peer pressure is real. And from that is where a person tries it. You might not know this. Uh, I see some young people by court order. So the court orders them to see me as a counselor, not as a drug counselor, but as a spiritual mentor. They say, yeah, yeah, you know, we know that you do youth work. This kid is going to go to prison for two years unless you take him on to see him two hours every week, every other week, and so on. Six of them, I'm seeing six of them at the moment. Some of them are former students from other places, some of them from our massages, and so on. There's none of them who don't have a drug issue. Every single terrorism case that has been prosecuted or brought to trial or a person has been charged with it, every single one of those young people had marijuana as one of their profile cases in their young days. It's a reality. It's not a reality that is usually shared with our community as much as it should be. Criticism. Blaming makes your son, your daughter, right for the wrong person to show them love. And finally, stony. Uh, this is where you just shut someone down and it's like, you know, I'm just, if, if you don't be quiet, alas, I'm going to put an end to you. I surround you, I break you all around. That you have no opportunity to share your feelings and what you feel or what you believe about the reality of a particular case or moment in time. 
So let's get more positive, inshallah. Let's talk about the good things that we want to see. So I want my family to become more functional. And I want you to understand that not because I speak to you about this, that you should assume that I've perfected this. You have to understand that. Don't look at me and say, oh, mashallah, shukran. My son gets in detention like yourself. Right? I have to tell my boy, my daughter, salah, 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 fajr, 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 like you do. This is sunnah Allah, right? So not because I speak to you about it, and nobody, let nobody, whoever stands in front of you as an expert in something, speak to you in a place of authority, that you assume that they've completed it in their life. After Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why he's al-Uswa al-Hasana, and nobody after him can be. Peace and blessings be upon him. So let's begin number one. What's the number one sign that your household, your family is functional as a Muslim is that you have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the words of the ulama. They would say, Aslih ma baynaka wa bayna Allah, yaslih Allah ma baynaka wa bayna nas. If you can fix your relationship with Allah, Allah will help you fix your relationship with other people. Sometimes, you know, when my wife's upset with me, she's not upset with me only because of me, she's upset with me because Allah turned her heart for me. There's something, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who turns the heart. In one of the most beautiful riwayah in the tafsir of Surah Taha, Musa alayhi salam, when he enters upon Fir'aun, he got scared. And Allah says in Surah Taha, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيْفَةً مُوسَى Musa, when he stood in front of Fir'aun, he became petrified inside himself. Allah can see his heart. So Allah said to him, Ya Musa, la takhaf fa inna qalbahu biyati. Musa, don't be scared because his heart is in my hand. SubhanAllah. kayfa asha. And Allah tells us that, you know, Fir'aun, he stood there and he looks at Musa, a person who is a wanted criminal, falsely accused of murder, a person who is insignificant, no army, no government, no backing for him, and Fir'aun lets him speak. Tell me about your God. It's ajeeb. Anybody else would say, take this man out of here, put him away. I never want to see him again. Take him outside, chop him. But Allah says, Al-Khaytu alayka mahabbatan minni. Ya Musa, I covered you, I cloaked you. al I threw upon you my love. When Allah loves you, when Allah loves your family, even with your mistakes, when you have a relationship with Allah, Allah shrouds you with His love. Allah puts His love upon you, protects your home, protects your children, in a way you can't protect them. And the first step is that relationship with Allah, rectify, fix the relationship with Allah, and Allah will help you. Allah says, وَعْتَصِمُ وَعْتَصِمُ Plural. Hold all of you together to the rope of Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, Hamdullahi al Quran. It's the word of Allah. Make the Quran a part of your life, a part of your family. The Quran is not just something read, but it's lived. It's not just something forced upon me and you and my, our children. It's not just read it and don't understand it. Its purpose is that it becomes a lifeline. The word rope is insignificant. Hold on to the lifeline that is given to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Loving for a higher purpose becomes the key to a successful household, a key to a successful marriage. That the love that we have with each other must go past the things we appreciate with each other. That my children must love me not just because I give them food and a roof and the clothing on their back. They must love me not just because I provide for them the things they want. That if, if those things weren't given from me, that they would forget me. That I'm not as important. My husband, my wife, you know, you, you can't have that that is the measure of love. You're not the ATM. You're not just a place where people take. But it must be one where there's a reciprocation. And that love is something when it's felt, it's a higher purpose. The greatest act of ibadah for myself and you is in mahabbah. Is that we love each other for Allah. 
And I remember, you know, may Allah have mercy upon my chef, Sheikh Muhammad Safat Nuruddin. He's one of the senior muhaddithin in Egypt. And I was studying with him Sahih in Bukhari, and he said to me, there's a hadith of Mahabba, a hadith of love. He said, he him to bin Nuri, what do you understand from this? I said, yeah, if you love other people. He goes, all of that is correct. He said, yeah, yeah, when Allah wants you to love someone, He wants you to love them when they're unlovable. Yeah, I mean, it's when your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife has done something that turns your heart to rock. Allah said that hearts can become like rock. At that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that where He's asking you. Wajabat mahabbati. My love becomes compulsory for those who love each other for no other reason than ajli, but because of me. If there was any, if Allah was not a part of our life, I would hate you. But because of Allah, there's love. I have to give you what other people would not receive from me. Number two from a functional, for a functional family is that they seek personal development. There's always something you want to achieve. You're not stagnant. There's either an educational pursuit, there's a savings plan to go to Hajj or Umrah. You want to go to Hajj, Shaykh Yahya, Allah Allah is it, mashallah, mabhub Shaykh for your Hajj. Inshallah, we're together. Wallahi, always the dua that I say, may Allah join us together. And Mr. Conte, if he was here, I went to Hajj. And while I was in Hajj, it was the day of Arafah, he sent me a message. And he said, Chef, make dua we're here together. Mr. Conte is one of our senior biology uh, science teachers. All the kids love him, mashallah. So, it's Arafah, and I said to him, I, I gave him a voice message. I said, Mr. Conte, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us here together next year. Wallahi, I said it's sincere from my heart. And then he sends back, he sends me a message, he said, Chef, before you make that, I made the same dua. Wallahi, the year after we were together. Wallahi, both of us, we were together. And he looks at me, he goes, did you forget? I said, I didn't forget, I thought you forgot. I, I wasn't going to tell you. He goes, no, you, no, you forgot, I reminded you. It was out of us. And he sat next to me in our Right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join us in our together, Allahumma. You have a savings plan to go to Umrah. You want to go on a trip together. You want to do. There's a personal development, a savings development, a financial, an educational development. But it has to be personal for you and also family network together. And one of the things that I think is important is that you can't be a better spouse if you're not trying to become a better person. You can't become a better father if you don't want to learn how to become a better father. Being a good father is not natural. Wallahi, I've learned this the hard way. Yeah, I mean, I'm learning how to become a good father. For many of us, it's trial and error. And sometimes what we saw with our fathers, what we saw with our mothers, what we saw with our grandparents, is not what we want for our children. And you can't just say, this is all I can do. There has to be personal development. There has to be an attempt for you to say, no, don't just help me with my son, I need help. What can I do, Chef, to, uh, to hold my tongue? How can I control my anger? Uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I know it's difficult to hear, but I want to lift stigma from it. And I write about it. You know, you can read articles in different papers that I've published for it about mental health issues. Some of us within our families, we have some people who maybe has developed a mental health issue. And they find it difficult to get treatment for it. The chance is that in this room, that there aren't at least five to 10 people who have an undiagnosed mental health issue, either depression, something of this nature, is unlikely. It's statistics, we're human beings. And their illnesses like other things are illnesses. So part of your professional development is you have to say to yourself, I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being obsessive. I'm tired of being suspicious. Where'd you go? Where'd you come from? I'm tired of wanting to know everything, every time and all. Those are all things that erode and ruin happiness in the home. Number three is communication. And subhanAllah, if I was 
to mention to you all the different hadith of the Prophet ﷺ communicating, whether communicating just with his eyes, like there's one hadith Aisha radiallahu anha, and I'm conscious of time. She said that the Prophet ﷺ, he came home, and we went out together, and after we were leaving, we went to visit someone, so we sat outside their home waiting to enter. فَأَتَتِ الْعَبُوفِ وَسَبَّتْنِي And this old woman came, and she was vulgar in her words to me. She's a non-Muslim. She looked at Aisha and she began, you are this and this and this, in front of my husband, in front of Nabiullah Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha says, فَنَظَرْتُ إِلَى رَجِلٍ I turned, not to ask him, I just looked at his face. فَرَأَيْتُ فِي وَجْهِ أَنَّهُ يَلْقَى I saw that if I was to respond to this lady, who I right to respond, she, she began. I saw in his face, if I respond, he would be upset with me. I held myself. She left, came back, abused me even more in front of Rasulullah. I looked to him, so I said, I saw in his face, he would be upset with me. I was quiet. ذهبت ورجع Again, third time. فنظرت في وجهي فرأيت أنه تلف. I saw in his face. Give it to me. صلى الله عليه وسلم. He wouldn't be upset. عائشة says from Tasawwat. I destroyed it. I gave it to her. فذهبت ورجع. She left, never dared come back. She knows Allah. But look at the communication of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Sahaba, they would say, We would know when he did something wrong, just from the look in his face. One of the key things for you and I to master is that we don't have to say, I'm, I'm upset or not. I remember when I was young, you know, I, you remember, I don't know about you, you remember when your father would look in the rear view mirror, just before you visit somebody's house, and he's parked. And I'd be sitting in the back seat, my brother Yasser and I, and my father would look in the mirror and catch my eye. I know what you want. And you and our children who train them have to turn on and off, mashallah. Some places they know on, full blast, their Porsches, other places they know to sit down. Right? SubhanAllah, we have this within us. Communication is a great thing. There is body language that communicates. And when you stand, with your child and they're seated or they're on the ground and you are above them and angry and loud and your face has changed in color, it is not communication. It is borderline abuse and can be abuse. You have to be careful what you project, what you look like, what you sound like, the words you choose. Of the worst levels of bad parenting, is to say what you don't need. So you, you, know, you say to your son something, oh, if you do this, I'll give you this. You didn't mean it. A woman, she came in front of the Prophet I said, her young child began to walk away. She said, Ud, come back here and I'll give you tamar. I'll give you a date, like a sweet. I'll give you chocolate. And the Prophet sees she had nothing. He said, don't lie to him. Don't lie to your child. Because if he comes back and you don't have it, you're destroying your child. Don't say what you don't mean. And if you say, mean it. So if you're going to discipline your child, and you say, listen, if you don't obey, if you don't do what is expected, when I return, or when, if it's not done, this will happen. It needs to happen. It's not just don't, don't, don't say things. No, say what you mean, but mean what you say. It's an essential, especially for young children. There's no compromise. And sometimes my wife and I, we might not agree on something I said or she said, but because it was said, even if I don't agree, I follow. And we'll talk about it later and say, listen, you know that, okay, but I held the ground. Because communication becomes the key to a functional household, to a functional marriage, to a functional life. Asking questions that we can understand from each other and expectations to be answered. In return, asking of our children things that we allow them to express it in a way that they feel comfortable, not wanting them to give us the answer we want to hear. One of the worst questions that you can ask is, did you pray, did you pray, did you pray? And you say, oh, 
but how do I know? Rather, you can change the question from did you pray to if you haven't prayed, join me, we'll pray together, even if you pray. Even if you pray. If you haven't prayed yet, I'm going to pray. Join me. It's a different question. It's a different form of communication. It allows your son not to feel, your daughter not to feel threatened to say, oh no, I didn't pray, but I better say it because he'll, he'll be upset, she'll be upset with me. Number four, understanding each other's languages of love. SubhanAllah. Uh, there's a, inshallah, maybe one day we can do this for fathers only. I don't know if you will come. I do a program called For Fathers Who Have Daughters. How to be a father of a daughter. It's not something I'm still learning, but it's something I've read a lot about. Because daughters need a great deal of love. They need for us to hold them, to feel our strength, to feel our love. That when I speak to her, cannot be in the way that I speak to a boy. That the voice has to come down. The look has to be into her eyes, not look past her. I have to let her begin with what she wants to say before I tell her what I want. I have to allow different times that maybe she's not ready to speak straight away, that I say, okay, maybe we can speak later. All of these are different things that become really important because all of us have different languages of love and we expect to be loved in different ways. And how one person is loved is not the way another person is loved even if they grew up in the same home, even twins. SubhanAllah, I have twin sisters. I mean, I'm not. They are twins, but untwins. Twins is what they wear, da, 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 da. but oh my goodness, SubhanAllah. Twins in shape and look and complete different in how they think and what their interests are. And how they receive love and how they express it and how they give it. Even within your household, it's something we must consider. Number five is to learn how to fight. Conflict. Uh, I, I always tell my students, I want you to learn how to fight with your parents. What do you mean, learn to fight with your parents? Wallahi, learning to fight with your parents right is going to teach you how to fight with your wife. It's going to teach you how to fight with your husband without breaking each other. Learning, learning how to argue with each other respectfully, without anger. Learning how to say, Wallahi, even with my father now, I'm a grown man. I have to fight with him sometimes. He'll say, yeah, yeah, I don't think this is a... I say, Baba, you know how much I love him. But I'm not going to do this. Then, why? In the end, in the end, you know my experience. I say, what? And that, stay there with us. How to learn to have conflict with your children, for them to feel comfortable to argue with you is a beautiful thing. Because if they don't argue with you, guess what happens? They complain about you. Like, if, if my son, if my daughter, in their heart, I'm not going to say it, that they won't even dignify me with a fight. They will just listen and they just, okay, say well, it. it's only 10 minutes. I'm going to hear it for 10 minutes. Halas. 10 minutes, 20 minutes. We used to be like this, right? Some of us were like, oh, it's not for long. Huh? 10 minutes, five minutes, it's gonna pass by. If that becomes you, if this is your child, then they just wait for the 10 minutes to go by, you've lost them. You've lost that ability to influence and change their life. What would you rather? A son, a daughter who tells you, Baba, that's not fair, and I'm gonna tell you why. Oh, okay, let me see that. Dad, tell me why. Why? Why is it not fair? Okay. You're right. And, and, and many times, when your children fight back, they're correct. Wallahi. Wallahi, in my experience. Many times, your children, when they fight back, they're correct. You need to listen. Conflict resolution will be the difference between a functional, happy life, 
and a dysfunctional, unhappy mother. To be able to combat with each other. Let me give you an example from the Sunnah, because I don't want you to think we're talking just philosophy and psychology. Ali ibn Abi Talib loved the Prophet enough to lay in his bed when he knows assassins are outside the door going to come in to murder. The Prophet tells him on the night of Hijrah, they are there, he sees them, sleep in my bed, and Ali stays there. Everybody made Hijrah except Ali Look at the love, the Muhammad had for the Prophet. On the day of Hudaybiyah, the Mushriki, they stood the Prophet in a place called Hudaybiyah outside Mecca and they said, You are not allowed to make Umrah. 1300 Sahaba of the Prophet, in Ihram, 10 days march and they're stopped. They can smell Mecca, but they're not allowed to drink its water or see it. So they begin to make a peace treaty with the Prophet. They said, Suhail ibn Amr, radiallahu anhu, will become a great Muslim after this moment. But he was the chief negotiator for Quraysh, the Mushrikeen. So Ali radiallahu anhu is ordered to be the scribe, to write down the peace treaty between Muhammad Sallallahu and Sayyid ibn Amr. They asked for the most offensive things from the Prophet They said to him, you come all this way, you're going to go back to Medina and you won't even see Mecca. You agree? I agree. That if one of you becomes an unbeliever, we will not return him. And if one of us in Mecca becomes a believer, you must return him to us. I agree. Ali begins the peace treaty by writing Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So Hayy ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, at that moment an unbeliever, he says, لَوْ آمَنَّا بِذَلِكْ مَخْتَلَفْ If you believe in this, we won't have a problem. Imraha, erase it. So the Prophet says to Ali, erase Allah Ahmad Rahim, write Bismik Allahum in the name of God. So Ali writes, he follows the order of the Prophet by saying, because Allah said, وَمَا أَتَاكَ الْرَسُولُ فَغُلُوهُ Anything Allah said, the Prophet gave you, take it. Whatever order he gives, do it. The next sentence, this is between Suhail ibn Amr on behalf of Quraysh, وَمُحَمَّدُ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ if I believe he's a messenger, why do we need peace? Ibnuha, take it out. Ali says, no. There's a difference. So the Prophet says to him, Ya Ali, erase it. Could you imagine? Could you imagine you look at Muhammad and he gives you an order and says, no. Allah. Allah told you, Atiyah Allah, what? Al Rasul, Atiyah Al Rasul. And he said, No, Allah, what? La, Ya Rasul Allah, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. No, O Messenger of Allah, I will not obey you, even, and I would rather that my father and mother die to protect you. I would rather I lose my parents for you, but I will not obey you in this instance. So I said, then, second time, Ali, erase it. On the letter, heavy. Second time he disobeys. Third time, La Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet smiled. So he knows this love. And the Prophet got up himself and erased it. The Prophet did it himself. Ali didn't obey Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because you and I need to know that even if you are an authority, you and I need to know that even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that there were those who abstained because of love. And that sometimes somebody might not do what you want, when you want it, how you want it, but it's because of love. And you need to be able to accept that even if you're the head of a family, even if you're the mother, even if you're the father, that you need to listen and expect that there may be conflict that you have to resolve. And you have to develop the tools to resolve it. Now, what give us a time, inshallah, that we can speak about it. There's two types that are envy with problems that we face. One set of problems are those that are solvable, day-to-day -day problems. Homework, 
your husband drives too fast, he keeps touching the phone while coming to Langford Islamic College and we hate that here at the school. Please don't do it, parents. Please. Wallahi, it upsets me so much. There's some parents that are on the phone while driving in our parking lot. Please don't do it. Don't do it on the streets coming here because it looks bad. It doesn't look good. And it's unsafe for you and others. May Allah protect our children. May Allah protect your vehicles and your home and your life along the way. Some problem, solve them. It takes a day or two to solve them. Other problems are perpetual. They come up, they die, they come back up. They're like grass. You have to keep mowing it, and keep watering it, and keep moving that I end, inshallah, tonight by saying that the key is to have a mind that is willing to solve the problem. If your mind is <laughs> closed, if your heart is closed, if you're unwilling to listen, if you've already made up your mind, if before you even enter you know what you think you know, you've already made decisions, everything is what you want, and it's my way or it's your way, you're going to have conflict, and that conflict is not going to be solved. But if you approach problems with that problem-solving mindset, where first you're optimistic, I have hope that if we speak about this, we can solve this problem. That if I approach them in the right way, if we change certain things, if we buy this or put that, or that if we make some changes, I have the hope that we can make this a solution. Number two, that there's empathy. That even though I haven't experienced the problem, I can put myself in his shoes, I can put myself in her shoes, I can see the problem from their side, not just my side. And it's not just my feelings, but my children's feelings, my wife's feelings, my husband's feelings. I can see how that would have looked to them, sounded to them, felt by them. Number three, that you're committed. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, any time that you have two husband and wife who are separated, in yurida islaha, If both of them want to solve the problem, Allah will give tawfiq. But if one wants and the other doesn't, it doesn't work. There has to be commitment to solving it. There has to be acceptance. That if I made a mistake, I accept it. If I know I'm wrong, I'm willing to acknowledge it. That there's a level of expect acceptance of each other and some of our inadequacies. And finally, that we have respect. And you and I don't have to agree on anything for us to be able to respect each other. Like, you might have one opinion, you might see the sky is blue, I see it orange. It's purple. And I say to you, the sky is purple, and you say the sky is blue. Because we see things different, does not give us, each other, the license to be rude and disrespectful to each other. We might have opposing views, but it is not excuse to lose the respect, to use the wrong word, the wrong behavior, the wrong attitude, the body language, the image. That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq, heal our home, protect our children, bless our school. The dua of Allah I always make on the river is may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our school and staff, our students, our parents, and our teachers. May Allah guide our principals and our board and administrators to what pleases Him and use us as tools of good for other people. Allahumma ameen. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and I uh, a good night and a good weekend, that we end the year on good and that we are able to fulfill the trust of leading your children to that which is good. I ask you by Allah that when your children leave the home, make for them the ruqya of the Prophet sallallahu Read for them ayat al kursi read for them surah al-fatiha, bismillah al-qim, in kulli I ask Allah to protect you from every eye, from every jealousy, from every harm. All of these are dua that you and I must have in our household. As you're driving into school, put on Quran rather than the radio. As you are tending for your morning and making your breakfast and lunch, put on Shabiyah and Rahim's YouTube lectures. No, I'm joking. Put on something that puts barakah, adds value to your home. Buy a bottle of water, five dollars, Zemzem, that you order online. Fill it, fill it and refill it. You know, the Prophet he says, 
that when you recite, you know, I'm water, and it's not something you need me to do. When you go home, get some water in a, in a bottle and recite Surah al fatiha and breathe on it. And ask Allah to protect you with it, breathe on it. And when the bottle would come down, they would say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah Naqsa, the water is almost done. And as he should be add water, he said, Zid, add water, fa inna barakat al Qur'an tasiru fi. The Qur'an will continue to recycle in it. SubhanAllah. How easy it is for us to heal ourselves with the Qur'an, with the barakah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completes us all good. And I leave you with the dua of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma inni asalim ta hubbah wa Allah ask you for your love. Wa hubbah man yuhibbu, the love of those who love you. Wa hubbah al-amal al-nabi yuhibbuna ila hubbik. And the love of the deeds that bring us closer to your love of Allah. Subhana rabbika wa bil-izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-musaleen. Wa alhamdulillah wa rabbil alameen. Subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa shiru wa laa ilahi 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 laa il